as I was thinking and reflecting about today, I've carried all of you in my heart over the past while since um, Chris, Krista and I had the conversation. Um, I had the privilege of traveling to New York last week. I landed yesterday, so I'm in a different time zone, but I'm here and I'm awake. Um, <laughs> but literally, um, I, I went to attend a conference on business and human rights and what that actually means in real life and practice, etc. Met global leaders who are doing this thing in practice and you know, obviously sharing and exchanging notes in terms of how we could actually um, make this thing real and tangible and practical. So as I was going through some of the sessions, I was thinking, geez, you know, I was actually looking at it from the lens of all of you in terms of what would be relevant, what would be necessary, and what would really be exciting. But one of the themes that kept coming, um, even as, as we are looking at the global picture of you know, business and human rights, um, and ethical leadership being sort of the you know, core discussion, because there is no way that you're going to advance any ethical advantage in an organization without the leadership buying into it. And so at the core of it, I realized that Ethics can be a very far-fetched concept. It can be like, oh yeah, you know, the leadership of that organization need to make sure that they're doing the right thing. But it's never about me. You know, what is my role in all of it? What is my contribution? You know, whenever I think of issues around corruption and everything, it always takes two to tango, right? It's, it's never just the one person offering. If you accept, you're equally liable or you were complicit in, you know, making it happen. So, so the overarching theme that I wanted to draw on for purposes of today is really about, you know, being conscious about our conduct, our actions, and, and you know, just really how we are living our lives in the context of work, even outside the boundaries of work. Are we conscious? Are we engaged enough? And, you know, just a small example, while, uh, while we were in New York, I traveled with, with my family, so I've got two young girls, got a three-year-old and a four-year-old. My husband's name is Champion, so... <laughs> <laughs> um, they're 12 months apart, <laughs> keeping me very busy and keeping our lives very exciting. And so we went in naturally to one of the stores to see what we could buy. Um, but with the Rand dollar exchange, it was interesting. So my little girl took a pair of beautiful like ballet shoes and she's like, mommy, look, mommy, look, you know. And literally she was walking out the shop with those shoes. And I thought, geez, honey, we haven't paid, you know. <laughs> We'll have to go through due process and she was keen like let's go whatever so it was an opportunity for me to teach her that you don't just take stuff you know and I actually started to think I've had so many moments that are considered small that no one would really ever know about where I've walked out of spa because I had like 10 things on my mind walked in took a pack of rolls walked out and then I realized when I got to the car oh my god is the sound okay uh, I realized, oh my God, I actually, these are not mine. I haven't paid for them, you know? And you know, the debate about, do I go back? Do I just, is it just, you know, a gift from God today or whatever? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what is this thing? And why is it even a debate? It's not my role. Let's go back and give them, you know? And I'm always amazed at how pleasantly surprised the staff are that you, I actually brought it back, you know? So why is it that um, we, we put ethics at such um, a huge distance? So I want to talk, um, just to guide our conversation, I'll talk about the global picture. What is currently happening in the world around this subject matter? And I know that it's a very extensive uh, conversation we could have. We could sit here the whole day and unpack where does it start, where does it end? Um, I recently did a course at Gibbs and it was like a business leadership course, but 50% of the content was on ethics. And we had all these high-flying, eight type personalities debating where it starts and where it ends. So today is really not about where does it start and where, where does it end. Today is really about the heart and the essence of it in terms of our everyday lives. Whether I'm leading in public, whether I'm leading my family, wherever I may be, am I an ethical individual and am I, am I aware of my conduct? Um, and, so, and so we'll speak about the global picture, we'll speak about nationally what's happening, some practical examples um, that you, know, you may be familiar with. And then we'll speak about organizationally, what does that look like? Here within AVRI, what does it look like? I'd like to hear your thoughts. And personally, I think at the end of the day, it really you know, boils down to me as an individual, what am I doing? Are we still okay? So what would you guys have done if uh, you found the roles? When you got to the car, would you have gone back? Would you? Who would have gone back? Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's not part of your KPIs. I just wanted to see whether. 
I'm in good company. Okay, so before I get into uh, the global landscape, and I'm not going to use the presentation as much, uh, but I wanted us to just align on what, you know, broadly ethics is defined as. It's basically defined as a set of moral standards distinguishing from right and wrong. Primarily, it's values driven and conforms to generally accepted norms and standards. And it's a consciousness, like I said, it's about us being aware of the importance of morality. So that's the definition I'd like to work with for purposes of today. It's really about, you know, what are the standards that guide our conduct in terms of what's right and what's wrong. And then, um, yeah, so in terms of the global landscape, there is a lot of activity happening. And, you know, even just from the conference I've recently attended, I realized that, you know, a lot of the, the human rights atrocities and, you know, you know the, the, the news reports that we're seeing on TV, on the internet, etc., really um, boils down to a question of ethics. It's about, are the leadership of these organizations taking it seriously enough, and is it trickling down, or is it just the policy that's gathering dust somewhere that we know is there, but no one actually quite knows what it says, you know? Um, so, yeah, I wanted to speak a little bit about globally, I mean, as we all know, there is a huge advancement of technology, um, and there's some statistics that speak about the number of devices that will be online in the next, you know, by 2020, and, and that's really shocking, you know, to think about how life is actually happening going forward and <laughs> how we need to be relevant, current, etc. You know, while there's good and there's bad, we just need to be aware that um, technology is forcing us now to be accountable for our actions whether you like it or not. I mean, if I say something that's contrary to what you guys believe, you're quite happy to tweet it. It can circulate, it can go viral in a moment. You know, so technology really gives us an amazing opportunity um, in this time to be able to hold each other accountable, to be able to challenge each other, to be able to raise behavior that we don't deem acceptable, even organizationally to say, hey, you know what? Reporting some stuff is going online depending on what those company policies are. So I think, you know, there is no way we can discuss ethics and the heart of it without looking at the impact that technology has on how we are doing life and how we are engaging each other. So if you think about the number of devices that will be online, in, you know, by 2020, I mean, that's obviously a huge number uh, of them. Um, the what happened before technology is very different to what's currently happening. So there is like an overarching sense in which we are at the back of our minds conscious that this could go viral. I mean, I'm just thinking about the current example of the gentleman who can't pronounce his name, who was on a beach and made a racist comment. And for the life of me, the guy has like literally, his life is very different now, you know, and how quickly technology can change our lives. But if we're also not conscious of what we're saying and what we're doing, you know, how quickly our lives can change. Um, and obviously, you know, some of you may know about you know, the Steinhoff debacle and, um, you know, there, you know, there's all sorts of issues, you know, around the Steinhoff issue, you know, but the bottom line is, in my view, the leadership of the organization, there was some behavior that happened. It may have started out as a small little seed, as a small little, okay, maybe let's just, you know, hold back on this and do that. And, you know, it seems innocent, but over time, the impact has been quite significant. I mean, the, the share price has dipped significantly. Um, so yeah, so from a global landscape, I just wanted to say, even just based on the conversations that have fed into my thinking around the topic, is that um, there is a lot of activity happening. The internet or technology is holding us accountable far more than it did before, and there is just no way we can run away from it. Whether you're on social media or not, you're still impacted by it. Um, and obviously, you know, various corporations, organizations, um, are now affected and you know things are out in the open and people must be held to account so i think broadly speaking there is a focus on it whether it's happening fast enough is you know um up for debate but there is a focus on the fact that you know what the consumer of today is not the co consumer of the past the consumer today is, is is a conscious buyer i'm not going to associate myself with a brand that does not speak to certain moral standards and and behaviors and so, so anything that doesn't speak to that will be exposed, it will come in the open, and we just need to be conscious of that. So, in terms of nationally, I, I really had to guard my heart <laughs> as I went through, you know, um, some of the research I was doing. And um, there's a lot to choose from. <laughs> there's a bouquet, like a buffet of stuff. Um, 
but I wanted to focus on just a few. And I didn't want to focus only on the negative things because there is some activity that's happening, even though it may be minimal. But um, I was actually reflecting because the, not so long ago was the Maragana massacre um, commemoration. And I was thinking, what actually happened since 2012? Like, does anyone know? <laughs> you know, since the massacre happened, you know, we all really were heartbroken about it. It opened our eyes to the fact that, you know, mining needs to really have a careful look at how are they doing business and all of that. Um, <coughs> But, you know, what of substance has come out of it? Um, I just know there was a commission of inquiry that was, you know, set up and there was obviously a whole lot of steps taken to make sure, you know, um, there's restitution, etc. But from, from a national perspective, it's one example that I thought we could all relate to, to say, you know, there's certain decisions that are taken within company boardrooms in the C-suite, as, as is said, um, that, that have much, much bigger impact than we could imagine. Um, and then, obviously, you know, with enterprise, the, uh, the listeriosis issue um, that, that broke out earlier in the year, I think late last year and early, early this year, you know, several deaths reported and whether or not all of them are, can be, you know, uh, basically held to, to enterprise is, 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 is a question. But, yeah, I mean, I think that also speaks again to it's very easy for, for the concept of of ethics to remain a policy that's written and, and parked somewhere to a point where you need to actually ask to what extent are these principles integrated into everyday business? If you had to ask your lowest end staff to your highest end staff, do we have the same understanding of what it means? Do we know practically what we need to do? How do we respond? If there's a challenge or a question posed to me, if someone offers me a bribe, how do I respond? You know, uh, but the issue of the listeriosis thing was for me relevant for, for this discussion because um, it speaks to the fact that, uh, you know, the, the, the point I wanted to pull, to pull from it is, is the fact that it's good and well to talk about ethics, but, you know, on one hand, but on the other hand, are we living it out, you know? Are we living it out? At the end of the day, when the rubber hits the road and the headlines are out, how do we then uh, reconcile these things? And, you know, we always have to challenge and ask the intention and the motive and why did we even end up in the situation? And then in terms of government, um, there's a lot, obviously, to choose from. I mean, there's been a change in leadership. And, you know, for most, it, you know, it's a positive change. And, you know, time will tell what, you know, what that means. But, you know, change in leadership is always good, in my view. And, you know, just to change the trajectory of things. But I was thinking about SARS and how for the longest time this for me was my, like, the baby I was proud of, you know. Um, but, um, yeah, I'm not sure currently because there's, you know, just a few questions being raised about the credibility of the institution, you know, and how they're getting, you know, how the taxpayers' monies are being used and how decisions are being made about, you know, taxpayers' money and all of that. So... Yeah, that's another, another trend that we need to watch carefully in terms of government. And then in terms of state-owned entities, I was actually listening to the news yesterday and they were speaking about ESCOM and there was a heated uh, debate. Uh, a gentleman called in and he was saying, yeah, you know, I think, I think it's a problem that, you know, ESCOM is getting obviously, you know, the, the largest uh, coal. Um, they're, they're the ones who are using up the most coal. And why is it that we're now supporting individual mining businesses? And why don't we just nationalize this whole thing? And, you know, it can get really interesting and it can be quite messy. But, the, you know, the point I want to make is there's a lot of conversation about state-owned entities, about the leadership thereof, about how things are done, the processes that are followed within those organizations. You know, is there, ethic, uh, is there ethical behavior involved in that? Isn't there? That's, you know, another question. But, you know, just moving away from private sector governments, state-owned entities, I wanted to focus on um, other initiatives. Um, one of my mentors was actually, I think, a nominee of the Unashamedly Ethical Awards. I don't know if anyone knows about them, but there's an organization, you know, spearheaded really to focus on this issue um, and to really raise up, you know, the banner of ethics within the nation. And I think globally, I looked at their website uh, last night and I was quite excited about the work that they're doing and the impact that they're having. Um, but yeah, that's an initiative that's been undertaken basically just to spread the good news about the fact that, you know, ethics is still the order of the day. Things haven't changed. Just because, you know, some culture has deemed it acceptable to do certain, certain things, this is still where the line should be drawn. Um, 
Yeah, and I mean, part of their focus is really on leadership of organizations and acknowledging and recognizing ethical behavior that's exceptional. And so the, you know, my one mentor was one of the nominees, which I, I thought was quite exciting. And the fact that you can be in a room with people who are really pushing this agenda, it's not, it's not just something that sits at the back burner. And then um, in, in, in the recent past, I had a conversation with a friend of mine and he was just saying, look guys, you know what, I'm moving on. I've been trying to, you know, uh, he's in like the media space and he's been trying to break into business and you know these exciting opportunities but he's just battling because he's not paying the bribe you know it's just in some ways that's seen as culture and in certain institutions that's how you do business if you're not willing sorry sorry for you you know um, and and we had the whole question about where do you thank you give start and where do they end you know and he was saying his argument was look thank you is in my culture um, he's closer so he's like in my culture, <laughs> you know, you have to say thank you. When someone has lended a hand and whatever, you must acknowledge it. And, you know, where's that governed? Is it even governed? Um, but I think that it's, you know, if you're in doubt, just rather not, you know. Um, if you have questions about the conduct in the first place, you shouldn't probably be engaging in it. So I'm not even going to get too much into that. Okay, so... <sighs> In terms of um, organizationally, and this is where I really want to spend a bit more time. I've been thinking a lot about the concept of seed time and harvest, and I thought it was actually appropriate, you know, in this context that, you know, all of us should understand, you know, seed time and harvest that, you know, you can sow and then at some point you will reap. Um, and all of us sitting here every day are sowing seeds in our conduct, in our behavior, in our actions, through our words. And, uh, you know, as, as I said that, I actually just remembered my first work experience was the most traumatic. Um, I'm a Christian by faith, and I've never prayed so much in my whole life. You know, I broke out of varsity. I was a high performer. I was ready to take on the world, you know. I was like, yes, let's do this. You know, I'm ready, ready to change the world with this optimism. And I went into the marketplace, and I was like, whoa. <laughs> You know, like, what is this? This is nothing quite like what I imagined. Um, but it was good. It was a good learning experience. It was a good growth moment for me. Um, it was a good moment for me to reflect on, in all of it, no matter what happens in my life, no matter what happens in my circumstances, no matter what happens in my department, I still have a responsibility. You know, I have no control over what the other person does. I may raise the issues, I may challenge, I may do whatever, but ultimately, I still have to take responsibility for my own actions. And this is where seed time and harvest come. And I really would like to part um, on this point. So as I said, you know, um, as we define the concept of, of what ethics is or are, in a context of an organization, obviously, there are some guiding principles. There are policies, there's, you know, um, forums and committees, etc., cetera, that, that guide us in terms of what is acceptable behavior in this context. So at AFGRI, there are values, um, and I know integrity is one of them. And um, integrity is basically when what you say and what you do are aligned. It's not like social media where what we see there and what we see here are like, <laughs> it's like, whoa, <laughs> you know? And I'm loving that organizations are using social media to measure whether, you know, this, this is the same person. Um, and so, yeah, so in an in a organizational context, we have, we have company values and standards that we can look to as our guide. So we know what's right, what's wrong, and when we are not in line or where there's a gray area, then we can engage and ask questions around that. Um, and having been on the side of an employee and now an employer, I obviously, you know, have seen both sides of the, of the coin and, and it really is quite interesting. But what doesn't change is the principle. The principle is whether I'm an employer or whether I'm in a leadership position or whether I'm submitting to some sort of authority, I still have the responsibility to govern myself. Like I still have the responsibility to, to make sure that I do, I keep my end of the bargain. So when I signed up to work for AFGRI, when I signed up to work for the different organizations I've worked for, it was a commitment I was making, not just to myself, but to the company to say, I'm giving my time to this organization, I'm giving my talent, and I'm giving my treasure. Time is the most important thing we could ever give. And when we do that, we're giving a huge thing. And so to stick to your end of the bargain, to stick to that commitment, and to say, look, I'm here and I'm fully here, 
If I'm here and I'm not fully here, then obviously I need to ask myself deeper questions. Why do I feel this way? And why am I, you know, um, challenged by, by where I am? So I read um, the Philadelphia Business Journal. And, you know, they were speaking about ethics within organizations, and I pulled a few things from there. It was just quite interesting to have a look at what the, what, what the core thieves are, just based on what was shared earlier in terms of the focus for AFGRI. Um, one of the things, so the whole research study was conducted, you know, within different organizations, and questions were asked about um, behavioral patterns of employees and employers and, you know, leadership within organizations. Uh, and what the big challenges were. And there were four key points that were raised in terms of people actually admitting and confessing that, look, I'm actually engaged in this type of you know, behavior. So the first one was the misuse of company time and resources. This was including like late coming, um, pursuing personal projects on company time, um, covering for colleagues who you know are just not doing what they're supposed to be doing, um, yeah, so the misuse of company time and resources really, it's about using the resources of someone else to advance your own agenda, where you actually have committed to say, look, I'm here and I'm fully here. And those resources are allocated to you to do what needs to be done within the organization. If you need any further assistance or help, you know, there's always room for those conversations to be had. So that was an interesting one. Um, and even on this, a recent um, example I have of this, in, in just in terms of our work, uh, was about, oh no, sorry, this example actually relates to theft, which is the second point. The second point is, you know, employee theft. So the first one was the misuse of company time and resources. So that's late coming and pursuing personal projects. The second one was employee theft. And often we think of theft like, I would never do that. I'm not a thief. I'm not a criminal, you know? Um, but theft actually, in, in, for purposes of this uh, report, was basically about producing inadequate, uh, inaccurate records or billing for time that you shouldn't be, I don't know uh, whether you use a time billing system within Africa, but you know, kind of putting hours that you know you actually haven't done, and you submit them and you're like, you know, it is what it is, I'm just keeping them quiet. Um, it's, it's not just about stealing money, but in terms of you know, theft, the one example that we recently had was uh, where we worked uh, with, a, with a company to kind of get out of this mess, was they had an HR person who was a very trusted resource within the organization. And this woman was just, you know, phenomenal, exceptional in her work, just had such institutional memory, had been there for like 14 years. Um, and then one month end, it was like, no man, there's something that's off in the payroll. And they had to now go through, you know, all the records and have a look, you know, um, trying to reconcile the figures. And then they realized that, you know what, actually this lady had a problem, like she, basically fiddled with the numbers and allocated some amount to herself. Um, so she got her salary. That salary was supposed to go to someone else, so she just changed banking details. It went into a third party's account, not hers directly, and somehow they traced it back to her. You know, the banks will never give you that information to confirm, but they were able to do, you know, the follow due process, and it came out that actually she was the one who had taken a chunk of cash. I mean, like, wow. I was like, no, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, these things happen, we see them out there, but it was so close to home, and it was someone I knew personally, like, within that organization. And I was like, wow, this requires a step back. Like, this person has been here 14 years and has been able to, like, take this money into an account that, you know, was subsequently then taken into her own personal kitty. And, you know, I, I didn't get the chance to see her because, you know, the legal process kind of um, started, you know, uh, rolling out. But it bothered me. I was like, there, there's, there's got to be a problem here. Like, if some, you know, and then they started, you know, so on the, on the leadership side, they were like, no, you know what, she's out and all of that. And, you know, I just challenged them to say, have you taken a step back and actually engaged her on what actually happened? Like, what drove you to this behavior? Why are we here? You've been here 14 years. We had, you know, I thought we had a trust relationship. Krista, imagine, like, <laughs> someone that you've worked with for that long. It's really, it's, it's disturbing, to say the least, you know? And I thought there might have been more to the issue than, than just what, you know, the finances reflected. So I challenged them to say, perhaps look at 
what drove her to this place. And it seemed as though, you know, there were some personal issues and stuff, and she just didn't come to, she didn't have the courage or muster up the courage to, to basically <laughs> share her personal challenges and ask for extra cash or whatever the case was. But this then led to that. And now, I mean, she's blacklisted. She's not going to get a job. No one's going to trust her. Like, and she's fairly like in her mid, probably mid 50s now, a whole legacy. You know, a whole legacy. And, you know, this just brings me to the point of reputation. And Warren Buffett says, reputation takes 20 years to build, but in a moment, it can be crashed, you know? And I was just thinking of people like Oscar Pistorius and what a phenomenal career he had built and how in a moment it was just all lost. In that moment of weakness, in that moment of challenge, we need to be able to stand and say, look, I don't care how I'm feeling right now. Maybe let me call a friend, you know? <laughs> Sometimes just call a friend. Sometimes speak to someone. So, you know, I think that going back to the point I made when I started is that within organizations like AFPI and whatever other corporate uh, entities, we are dealing with people. People are people. At some point, we all have the same needs. You know, it doesn't matter the level that I operate at. It doesn't matter the the level that my colleague operates at, at the end of the day, we all have a life outside of this work context. And I think that perhaps it's time to foster those relationships. It may not be with everybody, but it may be with just one person where you know that, you know, there is a safe place where you can share your challenges and your issues. And I believe that, you know, companies are really waking up to this, that there are now, you know, some forums or, you know, platforms within which these types of things can be addressed. But I wanted to use that example because it struck me that, a whole 14 year worth career is now basically, you know, um, um, come to nothing essentially. So I was sharing the points. The first one was the misuse of company time and resources. The second one was employee theft. And that was around record keeping, um, you know, claiming what you need to claim and not more, not less. Like just do what's right, stick within the boundary. You know, if you need anything extra, that's a different conversation. Then the other one, which was um, a highlight or was highlighted, was abusive behavior. And this was more around the abuse of power. This was more around if I am the boss, you will know my name. You know, if I'm the boss, you will know me. <laughs> you know, there are times in life where you go through stuff. And those moments that are difficult actually should prepare us and open up our hearts to be compassionate to those who come behind us. But for some reason, some of us harden along the way. You know, we need to just understand that we were once in that position and walk the journey with our colleagues and make sure that we are not now on the other end of the stick and being the employer we never wanted to be. So abusive behavior come, came out quite strong. Some of it was um, obviously verbal, verbal abuse, um, the issues of sexual harassment came up quite strongly and I wanted to speak specifically on sexual harassment and how I met a, a, a lady at, at this conference that I attended and she, she had, was presenting something on gender and sexual harassment and how she wants to change all the laws in Africa about this thing, you know, like, it's like, wow, that's really a big ambition, you know. <laughs> And really inspiring that she has the courage. And, you know, we had such a, a, an incredible conversation about this. And I said, what drove you to this? What made you write about this particular area? There's so many other interesting and exciting um, things. And she said, look, personal experience. She said, look, I've been there, girl. I have been there. I have been in a context where I studied my master's and I graduated. I needed to get now to PhD level. When I got there, I did all the research. I did all my part, my bargain, I kept. The other end was a challenge. And she was just speaking about the abuse of power in certain contexts, certain, certain institutions. And her, it was uh, all around human rights and whatever. I, I can't quite recall what her PhD um, was on. But she said to me, you know, the gentleman said to me, look, I'm not working in the office today. Come, come to my house, come consult. But this was an old man, Krista. <laughs> you know, it was an old man. Like, you know what you see? In my culture, we respect the elderly and <laughs> you just don't think about it like that you know so it was an old man and um he said to her come through you know come to my house let's consult at home and whatever and they had and she went you know innocently <coughs> wanting to go and like um consult on her thing and finish it up she got there and it was a whole different can of worms you know the guy was like 
So I just want to let you know that for you to graduate your PhD, you have to satisfy me. I know! <laughs> I was like, wow, you know? Um, and we laugh about it, but that was her reality, and it was actually quite heartbreaking. And you could see the passion, the emotion in her eyes that she had to literally throw a tantrum about it for her to graduate without um, compromising herself. And these issues are real, and I don't think I've spoken about often enough. Um, and I'm actually reminded of my own background and upbringing. As I was growing up, my mom is an attorney, and my dad is a serial entrepreneur, has been in business all his life. My mom, very industrious, was a lawyer, is still a lawyer. You know, lawyers never retire, right? <laughs> Even in our wheelchairs, we can still give legal advice. And we are ethical people, by the way. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was thinking about what has framed my perception on, on the subject matter and, and also thinking about the next generation because I've got two little girls. What does it mean for them? What am I transferring to them? What guidelines um, am I you know, um, handing down? And what was handed to me? And is it correct even? Have I even challenged it? You know, If I'm feeling like my gut feel, you know, that sense that you have that something could be off, even though you can't quite put your finger on it, Never undermine that, you know, never undermine, you know, those signals that there could actually be something <laughs> off here. And this has saved me, this has saved our lives, um, my husband and I, and, and I'll share that example now about, you know, a, a business decision that we had to make. But yeah, so there was a lot that shaped me. My dad, very also a businessman, but was like, look, I'm not going to entertain nonsense. Like, if, if you're not willing to do business properly, then let's not do it, you know. Um, and so those are the, the, the type of ideals and values that I hold dear to. And my mother-in-law, my husband's mother, is a PhD graduate. She's 65. She's 65 this year, got a PhD last year. And the pressure. <laughs> so I had such a, a, a heartwarming conversation with her when we sat down and I was just kind of learning more about her history and why are you so phenomenal? Tell me, you know, you've done so well for yourself, you know, take me through this journey. What, what, what did you go through? Was it always easy? And all those types of questions. And my goodness, hey, some of the things she shared were actually quite humbling. I mean, she was just, she's, she's a teacher, so she's in the education space and has always had a passion to, to teach. And even now, you know, still doing some work for UNISA, but she took me through how she had to basically, she always knew she was born for greatness. She always, she had no problem with her confidence um, and always performed well and was not about trying to prove a point. But she was always in, mo in situations where a lot of her colleagues advanced, and I'm speaking particularly her female colleagues advanced at the mercy of, you know, the abuse of power scenarios where they actually gave, they gave it away, you know, for, for the sake of moving to that next level. Um, and she was just taking me through, it's taken me much longer to where I am, but I'm here clean. I owe no one nothing. I, like nobody, you should see her speak, she's just like, you know, <laughs> so proud of herself. And I'm just like, yes, you know, these are the examples that we need to be seeing in real life. People that have actually made the decision and said, look, I'm not going to sell my soul for this thing. I will achieve my goals. It may take longer, but I will get there and I'm not going to compromise myself. So. Just in terms of abusive behavior, I think you know, it's very exciting that you guys are focusing on these areas and, and that there'll be a closer conversation and a closer eye to these things and hopefully um, can be addressed. Um, so that there's employee theft, misuse of company resources, abusive behavior. And then the last one was cyber slackers and cyber loafers, just in light of what we said around technology and how technology and social media, Twitter, um, Facebook, what's the other one? Instagram. <laughs> they refer to it as the gram, you know, the younger generation. I'm still young, but yeah, there's, there's people younger than me. <laughs> the gram. And how much money it's costing organizations um, in terms of time that's spent on those, on those sites. And I've also seen, you know, some corporations making the call to say, look, no, no social media in our company, sorry. You know, because people are just distracted and, 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 and there was um, a statistic that said 64% of employees visit websites uh, that are unrelated to their work every day, which is interesting. Um, so yeah, so those are some of the points that were raised in terms of organizationally, some of the issues um, companies were facing in terms of productivity um, and being able to measure what's right, what's not. 
So around ethics, I think these points all fit because it's really about, at the end of the day, I've made a commitment to Afri that I'm here. Am I here? And if I'm not, I need to reflect and say, why am I not? You know, I'm cheating. I'm cheating, not just myself, but I'm cheating. Like I'm not committing to my end of the bargain. Um, if there's stuff that I need to do, and I remember quite um, making this co uh, commitment to myself that, you know what, if I'm gonna be committed to an organization, even if I work long hours, you know, sometimes you get into a job and you realize, yo, it's actually like, you know, I get in at eight and I leave at 9 p.m. But you know, I've realized that those are often seasons in life. It's not a long wounded cycle. You can always move from that. You can always challenge that. You can always negotiate better terms. You can, there's always a way around it, but don't let another person's behavior affect how you do your life. So, those are very interesting um, and I enjoyed them. And I just wanted to also just share another example. Has anyone heard of Parktown Boys High School? Anyone been there? You, but you're a girl. <laughs> I know that. Oh, really? That's amazing. Actually, very amazing. Because the example I want to share, which you might be familiar with, is about the um, water polo coach. Have you heard of it? Yeah, the recent one. Wow. As a mother to daughters, I'm like, oh my God. I just feel like homeschooling, to be honest, you know? Because when I read that, and for those of you who are not aware, there was um, Parktown Boys High School in Parktown North, um, basically had a coach who was coaching water polo, if I'm correct, and was obviously, you know, these young boys were handed to his care for a couple of hours a day to do this, you know, coaching. And, um, <sighs> Unbeknownst to the trusting parents, you know, the coach happened to be, you know, now fostering different types of water polo. It was not what, you know, they had signed up for. Sexual behavior, pornography, um, rubbing his genitals against them, like hectic stuff. And I was reading recently that um, I think he pleaded guilty to 144 counts. And the parents were in that court and they were sitting there listening to the names of their children being mentioned. Like... For those of you who are parents, you know, uh, or those of you who have nephews and nieces, children within your context, it's just heartbreaking. And I mean, I know they were slightly older, like in their teens or something, but my goodness, I think for me, this, this example is really relevant because you are hired to do a job and you come here and your job affects 144 odd kids' lives for the worst. I mean, what kind of legacy is that? And, you know, I'm not here to criticize or anything, but that really just worked me up. I was like, no, honestly, if you don't want to be here, then, then don't be here, you know? But, but if you're going to be here, please give everything that you have. Commit. Because what I've realized as well is whatever you do and whatever you contribute, will always nothing can take that away from you. It's also, your, it's also adding to your life. It's not just about the organization. It's about you developing as an individual. So this season or whatever that you may deem difficult, hard, tough, taxing, whatever the term we want to use, it will always pay off for you. It's the seed. Just going back to the point, the seed that you sow in the season never, ever goes to waste. It will always come in handy. At some point, you can say, I was there. You know, I was at Afri and I was, you know. Um, and I'm saying this point to say our work affects people. Our work affects people, even though you're sitting drafting reports the whole day, whatever you know, the nature of your work may be, it affects someone. There's someone at the end of that report. There's someone at the end of those numbers you're calculating. We may not always see the faces like the water polo coach did, but our work actually affects and impacts so many people. Um, and we need to respect the work that we do. So that example really just um, brought it home. And, you know, just based on what was said, some of the common issues that are found in organizations, discrimination, uh, bullying, disrespect, favoritism, um, gender issues, um, men and women not getting the same pay, or whatever the case may be, <coughs> harassment, etc. cetera. Um, so, and then just to, to come towards the end of, of my contribution this morning, I, I wanted to just say on a personal level for me, this is a very, very important part of life. And I feel almost underemphasized. Firstly, um, like I said to you, I wanted to share an example. There's quite a few, but this particular one was one that I felt the cost of. Um, so my husband was a, a, a joint owner or partner of a company um, some years back. 
And this was such a phenomenal business. It was beautiful. It was, you know, doing management consulting in the mining industry and it was just flourishing. So he was in partnership with another gentleman and when he joined, um, my husband joined, it was um, the, the gentleman he partnered with was already, it was his business, so he just kind of bought in. But there was nothing to buy because there was a group which had money and then there was like, a non, like an entity that was dormant. So my husband's job was to come and make something of this dormant entity. And it was hectic. I mean, he had to build this thing, he had to prove himself from the ground up, he had to show the numbers. Every week it was like, okay, what have you done? Like, show me the results. You know, it was that type of thing and it was high pressure, very intense. And um, for five years, you know, my husband was doing this thing with this um, partner and it was just amazing. And I was like, wow, you guys are really building something incredible. <laughs> um, as time went on, you know, as the wife or a woman, and I'm sure a lot of the women can relate to this, that sometimes you can just sense that mm -mm, there's something that's not okay here. I'm not sure what it is. Um, so I just started watching closely, you know, so then started asking tough questions to my husband, challenging, you know, um, based on, you know, the value system of this business. Where are you guys going? In light of where you're going, what are the values and whatever? Because, you know, as opportunity comes, there's more room for you to get tempted, right? So if you don't master it now, it doesn't mean when the big opportunities come. You know, it's good practice to start where we are today and say, okay, no, thank you. I'm not going to deal with that. Then it's easier the next time, no matter how much millions or billions are involved. But if you say, oh, I'll just take it now and then later I'll, you know, when it's a bigger transaction that people know, you know, um, I'll, I'll sort it out. It doesn't work like that. And so anyway, they, they built this thing five years in and I remember towards the end of the fifth year, my husband was just finished. He was taxed like on every level because it was just always such a fight. And I realized the clash was a clash of values. It was a clash of values, belief systems, and how business should be done. And it was really a question of ethics. It was a question of, is this how we're going to do business? And I said, I, I refuse to be contaminated in that way. Like, I'm not, I don't want money that comes from deals that look like that, you know? And obviously, for my husband, it was quite a tricky situation to navigate because, okay, let's coach the guy on how to do it and, and, and. And so we tried the coaching, we tried different approaches, obviously, you know, proactively trying to say, look, maybe we should look at it this way, making recommendations, suggestions, doing our bit, you know, to try and salvage the situation. But it was clear, this is an ethics issue and it's a values issue. Your values are different, what do we do? There's money involved, there's years of investment involved. Do you stay, do you go, what do you do, you know? And <laughs> I remember quite clearly that um, December of the fifth year, just feeling like it's over, like we're done. It's, we've come to a point where the values clash and no one's willing to budge. These are our values, these are yours, it's not gonna work. And I just remember us walking away with like nothing. After all those years of hard work and we were like, yeah, no, life, <laughs> you know? It was very emotional, I'm actually getting emotional, but I think what we need to understand is our values will cost us something. You know, it's not just gonna happen. Like, for them to truly be tested, you need to be able to demonstrate that you really believe in what you say. And this boils down to the point of integrity. And we walked away and I was like, love, don't stress. We're gonna build again. You built that thing from nothing to something. What stops you from doing it again? Let's walk away, let's shake hands, let's make peace, you know? And I remember my brother-in-law was like, oh, guys, are you really gonna walk away? <laughs> he was like fostering this, come on guys, I know you guys are nice people, but really you're being taken for a ride here, like get some money out of this thing. But we made a, a judgment call like about the type of energy that we wanted to expend was rather, rather on building something new um, and really making peace for giving and just saying, you know what, it's okay. It's one of those things that didn't work the way we hoped, but we're gonna lose X amount of money and it's okay, we'll, we'll make it again. It's, it is what it is, but what we were not willing to lose was our reputation, first of all, was our, you know, our standards, was our belief systems, was our moral compass. It was like, no ways. I'd rather let the money go, it will come back, I'm sorry. You know, so just being quite clear with ourselves about what is tolerable and what isn't is, is really important. So I'm bringing this to the point of personal leadership that at the end of the day, I can never say whoever, you know, they said I must just give them 50,000, put it in a non-profit. No, it's about Lerato. If you had to tell this to someone that you value, do, do we all have someone that we value? Who is it that you want to make proud? 
Do you have someone that you want to make proud? I just think of my kids. I'm just like, when they grow up, I want them to say, no, my mom was solid, you know? She had values. She was a woman of her word and all of those amazing things. But those things don't just happen, right? I need to demonstrate that I'm a woman of my word. And um, so when it comes to that, I think we need to be very clear about our personal standards, right? Our personal standards, our company standards, align the two and then move forward from there. It all starts with me. That's the point I'm making. It's not about everything else because it's so easy to have a victim mindset about life and say, ah, you know, everybody else is doing this and that. No, what am I doing? What is my role? What is my responsibility? What do I have control over? And making sure that I stick to my end of the bargain. And, you know, just in light of the example I shared about my husband and I, I was just thinking, we're now four years later, and we're doing okay. Like, we're pretty good, actually, you know? <laughs> we're flourishing, you know? And maybe that is what we needed to clarify our beliefs, to clarify our values, to just be very upright and um, astute about, you know, this is, this is, this is what, we, what we believe. And um, I love the quote by John Maxwell. He says that everything rises and falls on leadership. But I think that it rises and falls on personal leadership first. Because if I can't govern myself, how can I then lead teams? How can I lead? We all have these ambitions to be the next whatever it may be. But if I'm unable to govern my own time, if I'm unable to govern my resources, how much more someone else's, how much more in other organizations? So, um, yeah, I just want to bring that um, to the end. And, and I wanted to also just throw in um, some other examples, like um, your Tiger Woods and them. And, you know, so many people that have built phenomenal careers, but, you know, have come to a place where it's all taken away. And one of my favorite um, verses in the Bible that I live by is, is in Ecclesiastes. And it says, a good name is better than fine perfume, you know. Um, there is nothing that can buy a good name. There is no money. You can't put monetary value on it. And um, as, we, as we go about our, our business within the company, I want to encourage us all to, um, to really reflect on what is our personal stance? Are we even conscious? Or are we like, you know, sometimes um, we take on stuff that we, we think, oh, it's just a small thing, like the rolls in the shop, like the shoes your daughter walks out with, like, you know, the small little things, those are the little things that count. It's the small foxes that spoil the vine. Um, and I was just thinking, those are my little girls. <laughs> They're much bigger now. Um, but these are some of the things that I would like um, to share with them about living um, a, a, a life of high moral value. And the first one is, does what I believe and what I... <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, sorry, English. <laughs> Does what I believe and what I do align? And at any point where they're challenged about decision making, about you know, which way do I go, you just need to ask the question, integrity. What I believe, what I do, are they in line? Am I being transparent about it? Um, sorry, there's just a few typos there, my apologies. The second point is, am I being transparent? And, and the point about transparency is the point I mentioned earlier that, you know, it's just so important. You, you can never know everything. And sometimes you can convince yourself of stuff. And it's so good to just always have someone that you're bouncing an idea off that can challenge you and say, look, mm -mm, I'm not quite sure about that. Maybe consider X, Y, Z. Because the power of these things, the power of darkness lies in a place where we have secrets, where there's no one that knows about it. I find that there's so much more liberty when I'm open about stuff. Am I putting myself in another's shoes? Like I said at the beginning, we all have a story to tell. We all have a purpose. We all have a history. We all come with a context. We all may, some of us may be even going through some stuff. You know, if you're in a position of leadership, are you looking after your people? And I'm not saying take um, what's not your space, but I'm saying are you paying that extra attention to your teams? And are you putting yourself in the shoes of those that you're leading? If you were in their position, would you want to be treated that way? And would I be proud to share what I'm doing with those that I value? So those are the questions that I would share with them to say, when, when you're stuck and you're not sure which way to go, I would ask these questions and make sure that you know, there's a piece about the decisions that I want to make.
Yeah, look, I mean, I think that was um, the conversation that we had at length with, with the organization. I mean, obviously, you know, the leadership was quite shattered um, by, by the, you know, the outcomes. And, and they had to reflect and say, did we do our best? Were we available? Were we, were we open? Do we even have those forums where people can share those things? And I've also realized that you can't always force people to share certain things. So it's really, again, a, a, an issue of a personal decision they make. But I think as organizations, it's about reflecting on, do we have some mechanisms in place that people can tap into? Um, and are we cultivating a leadership style that enables people to have those real conversations about life, without fear of judgment, you know. Um, on, you know, it, it, it can be quite tricky, but I think on a practical level, it really is about assessing what fora or what um, platforms do we have um, as an organization, because I, I suppose that's all you can do. You can facilitate those types of um, um, platforms for people to have conversations. And, and I think a lot of it really it boils down to leadership style as well. Um, are people able to, are you the kind of leader people want to share those things with? Or are you going to use it against them in the future? You know, it's those types of things. It's about creating a safe environment for your team to say, wow, this month has been rough. Could I get a staff loan? <laughs> you know, I'm not saying that should be perpetual behavior because we should be managing our budgets and stuff. But life does happen and in those moments. I think the biggest win is about leadership that is open, leadership that is trustworthy, that is not going to use your information against you in, in the future. So, yeah, it's about creating that platform. Your first question is about the, whether you know, morality is inborn or, or can be taught. Um, actually, as I was reflecting and, and researching on you know, the definition of ethics itself, I realized that we are shaped by different things, right? Our culture, our, our backgrounds, there's so much that feeds into what we believe to be right. And sometimes that actually could be not right. Do you know what I mean? Um, and so, so I think one would need to look back at your upbringing to reflect on what were the inputs I got and what do I fundamentally believe, which I think is an exercise we don't really do unless you know, we... We have to, um, and, and that's, that's, that's what brought us to the place of making that decision um, at the time we did with the business. But So I do think it can be taught. Um, the reason I say that is because if you come to an organization like Africa, there are certain moral standards. You uphold them or you don't, like there are consequences to not upholding them. And so I think the, the big thing, and w which is something we've been going through in our organization, is to talk through the actual values, because we assume everybody knows what integrity means. It could be a very different meaning to what the company thinks, but when you actually look at the value integrity, what does it mean for our organization? This is what it looks like in practice. It means you keep your word. It means your work is of an absolute high standard. It means whatever, whatever it may mean. It's about being clear about those things in an organization like an AFGI um, and not assuming that everybody would know what it means. Um, so I do believe it can be taught from that perspective. Um, and I realized that as we were going through our own values conversation that, you know, there may have been some different kind of thoughts around what certain values meant. Not that they were completely off, but we just needed to align. So, so that would be my response to the first one. The second one about the business decision was we had been at it for a while. Um, and whilst we were there, remember my husband was building an entity that was dormant. So there was nothing, there was nothing much happening and there was nothing to fight for at the point. But when we started making proper money, that's when the, <laughs> that's when the conversation started to happen because now there's something valuable that we you know, um, can, can start talking about. So the money started coming through and then we started to realize, wait a minute, my husband wanted to invest back in the business, for example. And the partner was like, whenever there's money, take it and run, you know, <laughs> type of thing. So it was, that's just one thing. It's not necessarily right or wrong, but it was just like, okay, wait a minute, we're building for the long haul. And he's like, just grab and go type of thing. So that was a huge thing. Um, other things were just around how we did business with our stakeholders and how we treated them um, and how we do business development because, you know, we are very relational people um, and we build relationships and then we, as a result, the opportunities come because business is about relationship. But, but I, I do know there's a place for actual selling, like you must sell at some point, but our primary method is relationship building. Um, and there was kind of a clash in terms of how that happens because building relationships takes time, right? And it's not like, a, you know, you can't just call, call and say, hey, you know, whatever. 
Um, but we're also good at building relationships, so the, the turnaround was quick. Um, and you know, there was a clash around how that was done. So there were a couple of things that built up, and on each we did try to engage. We tried to say, look, instead of taking all the money out, maybe take a percentage and let's keep some. But he, you know, he was like black and white, like, no, we take it out. It is a very strong personality, very strong character. It was like two bulls in a crawl type of thing. So we needed to make a judgment call and say, look, actually, we don't want to be 10 years in and still having these conversations. You know, it's been five years already and I, I'm not sure we're going anywhere. So it was really more a judgment call. The types of things we looked out for were, how do we make decisions around money, you know? Um, in fact, <laughs> one of our business mentors said to us, if you want to go into partnership with someone, just take them out for lunch, go for lunch and um, share a plate and just see how they eat. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> so if they leave some for you, then you know it's going to be good. <laughs> if they share the fries and they, you know, give you some ketchup, whatever. But yeah, so, so I think it's, it's really about... <laughs> it's a judgment call thing, yeah.